Hey, it's Todd. I thought today I'd spend a little bit of time talking about maybe the one missing piece of hex crawling that I haven't covered in much detail so far, and that would be building up encounters, encounter tables, and running them in your hex crawl. This is one that's probably gonna be more on the philosophy of encounters in the hex crawl and building your tables a little bit or using resources that you already may have. And talking a little bit about how you can utilize them in different ways and what the basic process is for running them. So first of all, uh, fifth edition didn't ship with any kind of random encounter support. And that, and what I mean is that when you look at the player's handbook, which is, you know, which you could play the game just with the player's handbook or with the basic rules. There's really nothing said about random encounters. When you get to the Dungeons Masters guide, it gives you some guidance and it gives one example table, but doesn't give, it doesn't have a lot of robust support. It wasn't until, I think it was uh, Xanathar's guide, that they really gave maybe a more or less classic rundown of random encounters with a lot of tables that you could draw from and use in your campaign. Also, if you happen to have Tomb of Annihilation, that also has some random encounters. And it's interesting because they use them a little bit differently. I'm not sure. I don't remember which one came first. I want to say it's Xanathar's and then Tomb of Annihilation. But their treatments are slightly different. Obviously, one is building it as far as in a particular campaign. And I think it's useful to look at that when you're building for your own campaign. Whereas the other one, the one in Xanathar's, is more of a general case. Now, if you have older versions of the game, the encounter, the ways they build encounters in those games work totally fine as well. It's really all about, as you're starting, come up with the philosophy, whatever it is of what you want to uh, use for random encounters, whether it's roll once a day, roll three times a day, roll once in the day and once in the night, roll at different intervals, how different terrain interacts with these tables. So for example, in the original version of the game, depending on what terrain you're in would determine how likely it was that there was a random encounter. In when you get to first edition, they do things a little bit differently. It seems to be more about one, obviously what monsters, what creatures exist in different terrain, but also about how often you check. So different terrain types will have you check different times during the day, different intervals during the day. Fifth, fifth edition, I think, at least as far as Tomb of Annihil Annihilation goes, and maybe in Xanathar's 2, they, they suggest, I think it is in Tomb anyway, they suggest three three checks in a day. So you already you have, and I'm sure if I were to look up second edition, or third edition, or fourth edition, they probably all have different variations on that guidance. The point is, is find the one that works for your table. If you are someone who really likes granularity, then maybe the first edition DMG, which I have... Let's see, digging through this pile of books. First edition DMG talks about, theirs is probably the most granular that I ran across in my little survey. So they will talk about the frequency of encounter time, encounter checks for different terrains. So if you're in the plains, you're gonna check in the morning, the evening, at midnight. If you're in a brush or scrub, you're gonna check in the morning, the evening, the nighttime, and then pre-dawn. Forest, you check each one of these intervals, same marsh, you check each one of those intervals. Mountains, you're only going to check in the morning, at night, and that's it. So you can see that that's how they choose to handle different terrain types as far as... So that's one part of the puzzle. So let me, let me uh, back up a little bit. So you have these different parts of the puzzle as far as your encounter tables. One is terrain. What kind of terrain are you in? How does that affect not only the specific monsters that are on your table that you'll build or use from your resource of choice, but how often you're going to interact with that table. The way first edition did it is that depending on where you were, they basically split the day up into morning, noon, sort of evening, dusk, evening or, you know, twilight, nighttime, midnight, and pre-dawn. So, so each daylight and nighttime basically have three intervals in each one of those, and depending on where you are, will determine if you're checking in each one of those. I actually like those intervals just as far as in general hex crawling because it's a good sort of check-in point for players. You know, if you're marching in the morning, then you're stopping at lunch, which gives you that kind of noontime check-in. Then it's, the next part is, okay, you're getting dark. Maybe you're starting to think about camp or if you're gonna force march, but that's another kind of check-in point. And then nighttime, either your first watch or if they are marching in the night, then you have night, then you have midnight, which might be your second watch. And then pre-dawn, maybe your third watch, depending on how you do your watches. But it's kind of nice. You have these segments so that you can, if you're narrating through a hex crawl, those are good sort of check-in points. Your morning, 
your noon, which which also would integrate like your lunch break, then your sort of afternoon into the evening, then nighttime, late night, and then you know basically pre morning. So those are I, I kind of like those for that aspect of it. But that granularity is not for everyone. That's obviously going to be depending on how fast you're role playing and what's going on. You could be rolling a lot of checks if you're moving through the forest and the party isn't. Uh, spending a particular amount of time in each one of those intervals, you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna be rattling through six, potentially six checks really quickly. Maybe that's your style. If it's not, then you can go to something. I think the real old school one was basically one in six chance, or, or X in six chance, I should say, once a day. And that what that X would be would change. So I think if you were in the swamp, it was you had a 50% chance. If you were in the plains, I think it was just a one in six chance and then other ones were, were sort of in the middle. So again, that's another way to do it. So you want to think about if we're talking about the philosophy of how the terrain is interacting with the chance of encounters, just think about in general how you, how you want to do that. So whichever one you choose, you just want to stick with it. So you pick the one that gives you the kind of mechanically supported fiction that you want, right? So if you if you feel like planes, I think, are often ones that don't have a lot of chance for encounters because you have such distance that people aren't going to run into each other unless they're kind of trying to. So it's harder to get surprised because you can see for miles and miles. Whether I could see, whereas in, in say, in first in first edition, the reason why they give, maybe give Forest a lot of chance for encounters is because it's so, you, you're so obstructed, there could be a lot of things around that you're not going to see. So your chances are of these things bumping into each other are a lot more. It's harder to avoid things through early spotting uh, than you can in the plains. And of course, mountains, you think of being remote and not exactly fertile, so there's less things there. If you're looking at sort of a food chain kind of effect, then you're not going to have a lot of stuff in the mountains because not a lot of stuff lives there, and so it's going to be more sparse. So you can see the logic working, but essentially you just want to create the logic that's going to work for you, whatever that is. And the die type, you know, you're going to find uh, first edition to rolling for encounters, they're using a d20 or a d12 or a d10 depending on, again, another factor which may or may not work for you, which is basically how sparsely populated. When they mean Piper, they mean really as far as sort of the, you know, civilized uh, uh, areas. So, you know, where the, uh, where your kingdoms, where your kingdoms and your and your villages and th that sort of stuff is. So the further you get into the wilderness, the, the higher chance of, of an encounter is. So in the wilderness, it's one in 10 if it's in a sparsely populated area, which may be on the frontiers or where there just might be villages and outposts, then it's one in 12. And if you're kind of within national or kingdom borders that are fairly settled, then it's going to be one in 20. So that's how they figure that out. Again, you just want to come up with a math that's going to work for you. The, the important thing, again, it's that philosophy of, okay, does it matter how far you are from, instead of calling it civilized, let's just say domesticated lands, how far you are from organi organized society. If you're very close or you're in, in areas of organized society, there's probably going to be a lot less random wild things happening because it's been settled and organized and domesticated. Further you move out, that changes it, and you can do the, again, you can do this in different ways. First edition does it by how, what the chances are of an encounter. You could also do it by saying, well, I'm gonna change my encounter table. If this is my encounter table for wild planes, I'm gonna have a separate encounter table or, or more limited encounter table for domesticated planes. So the chance of encounter doesn't change, but instead of running into lions, tigers, and bears, I'm gonna run into farmers, maybe some mercenaries, and brigands. How are that works. Once you've figured that stuff out, the next thing is you want to look at is what is actually in these tables. I mentioned that Tomb of Annihilation and the DMG, or sorry, Xanathars, handle these things slightly in a different take. So Xanathars gives you basically pull in my bookmark here. They basically give you a level appropriate list or range. So everything is going to be dependent on what level you are. So you come to their list of tables, come to their list of tables like so. They're laid out by terrain, but also by counter level or party level. So you'll see I'm looking at Arctic Encounters, levels 1 through 4, levels 5 through 10, levels 11 through 16, 17 through 20. I'm not a fan of this approach. It's the sort of the Skyrim role-playing game or computer role-playing game logic where everything is scaling to you. So for instance, going back into here, I don't know why I closed it. If I go to look, why, why am I encountering 16 to 20? So if I rolled a 20, and this is out of 100. So I rolled 20 out of, out of 100 and I'm level one through four, I get some kobolds, either winged kobolds or non-winged kobolds. But then same area, I come back five levels later, now there are a bunch of berserkers. I come back five levels after that, and now it's white dragons, young white dragons, and then five levels after that, and it's frost giants. I'm not 
the, the thing I like about the wilderness is that it is really where everything combines. Part of the thing that I like, part of the thing that that kind of keeps me excited about the wilderness is you can really run into anything. And now granted, you can still run into lots of different things, but what makes it sort of dynamic and interesting and fun is you're not going to run into the level appropriate things necessarily. You're not running into the stuff that just happens to be matched up with you. That always bothered me in Skyrim or one of these, or I, I didn't play Skyrim that much. I forget the one before Oblivion, I guess I played a lot of. And I would go and I'd kill some goblins and I'd go and I'd level up, do so come back and the goblins are kind of the all of a sudden they're about the same level as me, give or take, and it just used to drive me nuts because it's just the same goblin, but suddenly it's a more powerful goblin. Well, this is the kind of same system, only it, I would leave and then a goblin doesn't spawn anymore and now it's a bugbear. And then the bugbear leaves and now it's an ogre mage. And it just kind of keeps, I want to be, I want to go back and beat up on some goblins if I want to, but I also want the fact that I could be on my way to beat up some goblins and then, yeah, a young white dragon shows up and I'm freaked out because I can't, I can't take on a young white dragon. So what do I do? And it's that kind of decision making that I like. It's that kind of dynamism that I'm not just marching from, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do and this is what I'm supposed to do and this is what I'm supposed to do to, I really feel that I'm out in this world and there are dragons flying around in this world and there may be a, a fire giant wandering around or a earth elemental or a troop of ogres or a tribe of kobolds who are trying to find a new home. And I might run into them and how do I react about that? And then I have to think outside the box because I can't rely on the fact that, well, gee, I'm level four, so everything I run into is gonna be about my level, so I can just attack it. Eh, wrong answer because if I run into a fire giant and I'm level four, there's no, I gotta figure out something else to do, which may be run away, wholly valid, try to evade them. It may be, excuse me, Mr. Giant, would you please not kill me? Can I do a service for you and, and, and to show you that I'm I'm not a threat? That could be another option. And y you know, it doesn't even have to be that I'm acting like a, ca a you know, uh, I'm just gonna surrender. It could be that, well, what if I can follow that fire giant, wait till they fall asleep and then rifle through their loot? Because if I can do that, which is super risky, but if I can do that and get away with it, I know that they're gonna have really cool stuff because they're a really, you know, high level creature and I'm a little, so it gives me a lot of different options to play the game. And it, I, for me, it makes the world feel dynamic. So I'm not a huge fan of the Xanathar approach of leveling everything. Now, what you could do is you could take apart their tables and essentially combine them all. You move the numbers around so you get with one. 1D100 is a good one for encounters. It gives you quite a bit of, I don't know if you need more than 100 different options of things to do. And usually they give you ranges so that you could probably take everything and, and do it up to 100 or the ranges are nice because you can set your you can set the your probabilities because it's probably not the same chance in the forest that you're going to run into a you know red dragon versus you're going to run into a squirrel so not having a hundred things means that you can play around with the probabilities to get what you want but it, you could probably figure it out. I don't know how many there are. You might need to have use some tables and subtables, which some of the other editions had. They would have like, okay, you've rolled in an, a, a flying creature, and then it would have a subtable of flying creatures, so you could bounce it out. But in any case, I don't like the fact that everything was this in these little level dependent level range boxes. But you can get rid of it. I would encourage you to get rid of it. And in fact, when you go to look at Tomb of Annihilation, they don't do that. Now I haven't looked at all the levels of things. So I know that I forget what level range the the uh, campaign is in, so I'm assuming that all this stuff falls more or less into the level range, but again, you don't have to. Here are those encounter tables. Now, the, unfortunately for usage in a campaign as a guide, it's a great as a guide, but it's all, you know, there, this is for this campaign, so it's all jungle, you know, that sort of thing. So you have you have a jungle, you have these different areas, you have uh, three columns of jungle, depending on what kind of undead are there, if any. They have beach as a terrain, mountains, rivers, ruins, swamps, and Wasteland, that's in addition to, I think there are some urban encounters if you are in Chult. But again, you can see from here, big list of creatures, you know, more here. I don't know, I haven't counted them all. And then depending on where you are, different chances of doing it. And I think the key thing is ultimately what you wanna do is for your campaign to have your own custom table like this. So what you could do is you could take a table like this, you could use it as a guide, you could kind of eyeball it and see what they're doing, which as far as which creatures show up more often. I would assume that the lower creatures are going to show up more. Yeah, I like to think of it kind of as a food pyramid. You're going to have your sort of herbivores and, and non-threatening creatures are probably going to have the highest probability of showing up. And then you'll go on from that until you have your sort of apex predators and super predators. So I would use that as a guide for, 
for creating those numbers, but you're just gonna put in a bunch of creatures and this is where you're gonna take any kind of custom creatures that you have in your campaign. If you have a campaign that doesn't have some of the basic or your conventional D&D creatures, take them out, you know, whichever creatures you put in, putting in, but you're gonna make a big list, put some dice on there, and then you're gonna roll it. Hey, sorry to take a long video and make it even longer, but I wanted to spend a couple seconds asking that. If you enjoy these videos, they take me a long time just to record. They take me an even longer time to edit as I'm a one-man shop. So if you like them, if you find them useful, please like the videos on YouTube and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. It really helped me out a lot. Encounter tables, or encounter tables, I guess, as far as the system goes, isn't just about the creatures on the table. There are basically three elements that are important for your encounter system. One is, you know, what... So we can look at the Tomb of Annihilation tables and see, okay, we've got Arakakra, we've got Albino Dwarves, we have Assassin Vines, we have Axe Beaks, we have Baboons. So that's the what, right? What, what is there? The second part of it is how many are there. And this is something that's changed a bit. I like the old school... Monster Manual approach. The old school method was that in the wilderness, depending on the creature type, you could run into a bunch of things, a bunch of creatures. The reason being that it wasn't just about, when you're in a dungeon, you're running into little forces. The party size, more or less around yours, maybe somewhat more, maybe you know a little bit less, so maybe you have eight or 12 or 16. But these creatures are their, their, maybe they're guards, maybe they're local residents, maybe they're adventurers like you, but they're in small numbers, you're in a compact space. When you get out into the overland, into the wilderness level, you're no longer dealing just with these small parties. You're dealing with potentially large groups. We want to call them tribes, families, organized societies of creatures. So you get to something like this. And if you look at the goblins or the gnolls, you can see that the chances, or rather the number of goblins that you could find out in the wilderness is between 40 and 400. And the amount of gnolls is 20 to 200. When you get to those upper ends, you're talking about potentially running into a whole village, or however you want to organize it. Could be a village, could be a, uh, you know, if, they, if they're, depending if they're nomadic or if they're sedentary, you have to decide, is this the lair, so to speak, of the goblins where they're, where they're living and that's their base of operations? Is it a large troop that's moving through? Whatever it is, you can run into a whole bunch of them and they'll actually would go into detail saying, hey, for every 20 gnolls encounter, there's going to be a leader that's more powerful. If there's more than 100, there's going to be more different types. How many? It might be kids and non-fighting uh, individuals. So what you have is not only the type of creature you have, but then this element of, in a sense, the numbers can edu the numbers can be an indicator of what they're doing. Because one of the things, I guess, to jump out a little bit, one of the pro one of the things I think that gives people hard times with random encounters in any milieu, whether it's in dungeon crawls, whether it's in hex crawls, is that it seems random. You use, you're in a space, you roll 20 goblins, so you just throw some goblins out there, and you're like, I, I don't know why they're here. They're just goblins, right? And and when players see that, it it doesn't it feels disjointed and it probably feels disjointed to the gym because it's why are these goblins here i don't know just goblins roll initiative but the idea is that you're supposed to take this stuff these random elements that you have behind your screen but by the time you project it in front of the screen to your players it's not random anymore you've decided you've taken a moment you've gathered your thoughts you've said okay i've rolled gnolls i've rolled 140 of them i'm gonna take a moment to figure out what is this organization of gnolls because 140 of them, it's not a little scouting mission. It's not a little, it's too big to be a raiding party. What is it? So in my campaign world, let's say, I'm going to say that gnolls are from the mountains. They're in a forest. They're not particularly close to the mountains. So what is it? I'm going to say, okay, it's a bunch of gnolls that were chased out of their uh, their traditional grounds, their, their traditional lands by something else. I'm not sure why. And they're looking for somewhere new to settle and they're moving through. So then that becomes the story. So by the time when I speak about these gnolls, now I have this grounding in, in the reality of the campaign 
when I present it to them, it shouldn't feel random. It should feel like, ooh, this neat thing. Like, wow, we ran into this whole thing of troop of gnolls going through the woods and there are some females and their leaders. And then what are they doing? And maybe the gnolls, I like to use morale. I talk about that a lot in reactions. So I might think about, well, these guys are, they're going to be protected, but they're going to be defensive. They're not here to raid right now. They need to find, they're, they're, you know, they're running for their lives or something more powerful than they were. So they're going to be open to parlay. They may not want to kill some adventurers and draw the attention of the domesticated lands. So they may be open to parlay or something else, or even they may even try to evade if they can, because they're, they, have goals that are beyond just we're randomly here right and i think that's important you know think about when you're creating these encounters from your rolling of the dice and all stuff that you're giving them goals that are just not where we're here to be an obstacle to the party no why are you here and so in this case i'll say okay Knowles, 140 of them they're far from their home what are they doing they're running away from something else and that's great because it gives me a hook for something later to think about, well, what are they running from? And then maybe I got to roll up something else, find something, you know, and f rifle through and say, oh, what are they running from? Uh, I don't know. Let me flip through. Uh, they're running from, you, you know, a, a, a sphinx chased them out. I don't know. And sphinxes are pretty tough. That's my work. Or a oh, purple worm. A uh, purple worm or, you know, quasits. I don't know. Rakshasas are here. I don't know. I gotta, I gotta find something. But I, I'm gonna find something and I'm gonna... Then there's a little story that I'm telling. So the numbers can be something that help you create that story. So you've got... Who or what is it? How many of them are there? And it could just be one. Could be 200. But come up with a range that suits you. Again, the old... The old monster manuals are great. They had these kind of number appearing. They also had percentage in lair. Which was good. You could roll that to see if you came to where they lived. Some of them you're going to find only in their lairs. Some of them maybe never in their lairs. And the lairs thing was also important for treasure determination. If you catch, catch a creature away from its lair, it's probably not going to have treasure unless it's wears clothes and carries treasure with it. Otherwise, you have to find out where it lived, which again is another device you can use to spice up your wilderness or anything else. Because if you run into, say, let me see, I had, a, I don't know why I keep closing this one. I think I'm going to go. So you have a, let's see what we got here. I'm looking at a harpy, treasure type C. Percent in layer, 25%. I don't know. What's treasure type C? I could, I, those numbers always, do they have any? This might be one of those things, too, where the treasures are actually in the DMG, but they mention them in the monster manual. Yeah, so they don't have the treasure types in here, do they? I don't know. So treasure type C. So the harpy's got something. So if I'm the party and I'm experienced, I, I know some things, I think, okay, we've got this harpy, but if I, the harpy flying around in here, if we take it out, not going to have a lot on it. But are we near their lair? And if we could find that lair, then maybe there's treasure, which is more reason for us to explore this wilderness. Make survival checks. See if I can find tracks. I get a harpy, it's in the air. Maybe there's something else I can figure out. If I'm playing the ranger, maybe there's some other method I can come up with to be smart and say, hey, I can find their feathers stuck in branches of these trees, whatever it is. I can find out where they are. I could climb up. I know that they live. Where do harpies live? Does it say here? I would say they live kind of in rocks. Let's see. No, they don't say here, but they got a body of a vulture. Oh, dwell along sea coasts. Okay. So there, so if I'm near, if I'm a ranger and I, and I have some knowledge, I say, okay, they like to, they like to uh, make their nests in sort of cliff faces along the coast. So if we're near the coast, maybe I can find that cliff face. That just gives me another thing. And, that was, and again, it's that decision making because if we're on a quest, we need to go north. But now we got this chance at, at basically finding unprotected treasure, but that's going to take us west do we have time to do that how do we do that can we swing it Ooh, it's tempting because uh, it's, it's basically at this point you already killed the harpy so it's free loot if we can find it what do we do that's an interesting decision and that's i think ultimately what we everything we're doing here is we're trying to create these interesting situations so who are they how many they are layering stuff is good for basically part of that what are they doing there are they just living there are they passing through that kind of coming up with the goal and then the third thing and really the third important thing because the the goals and stuff is not that it's not important but really you're going to take these three things and you're going to take numbers you're going to take a bunch of stuff and then you're going to create those goals but the really third key thing is how far away you are when you're spotted or when this encounter comes up and the reason why that's so important is that really because distance is time if every time you're rolling up an encounter and they're right at 30 feet that's just initiative it's was basically you're 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 doing the final fantasy you step on the wrong pixel and the the 
the screen swirls and you're in a, a battlefield. That's that's really close. And in a dungeon, it can happen more often because there's limited line of sight. You're running in passages and rooms and there's all kinds of barriers to keep you from looking. For the most part, in the wilderness, you have a lot longer distance. And what that distance does is it gives you time for you playing as the creatures and for the party to one, discover themselves, because you could roll up a random encounter and you roll a couple of dice. In older editions, they used basically surprise checks. And you could be that you guys could, the party could be here, this other encounter could be here, and they don't see each other. And then if you determine that, let's say the, uh, uh, the tribe of goblins is moving west, and the party's moving north, they might just pass like, you know, like ships in the night, just go right by each other and not notice it. Or one party might spot each other and the other one doesn't. I think, you know, now we probably wouldn't use flat surprise checks. You would do something with maybe uh, move silently, I don't know, or some kind of survival check, depending on what the groups are doing, just to determine who sees whom or who senses whom or who finds traces of whom. But basically, that distance gives you time for everybody to make those decisions because if they're 120 feet away or they're 100 you know a football field away they're 100 yards away then that opens up a lot of options for you and you really want to give those options it's fine sometimes for you to be in a woods or some kind of heavily you're in the valley and you come over the hilltop and these other guys are coming over the hilltop and you're just face to face suddenly but it can't be that all the time it breaks that sense of immersion because as a player you're going to be thinking about it going why am i not seeing these people or hearing them or finding any trace of them why are they always just right in front of me and plus as the when you're playing with the creatures maybe some creatures can't do some of the things they would want to do because they're suddenly in melee or really close when really if they had their druthers they'd want to they'd want to be 200 feet back because they're going to take off in the air and fly away maybe or they're going to do something else you don't know so again it's that dynamism it's that creation of interesting decisions and the space that forces you to either approach or walk away from, it gives time for decisions because even if a creature starts running at you and you're in that kind of, an, and it is initiative, but you're 200 feet away, then at least you have a couple of rounds to figure out, okay, how are we going to do this? Let's, can we get to cover? What protective spells can we do? Can we, can we just try to evade it? Are we faster than we can get away? Or when both sides are wary, they have that time to kind of figure out, well, they're not attacking us. I don't want to attack them. Can we put together a, a, a flag of truce or make some kind of signal for parlay? Can we do that? So that distance is important. And I think sometimes it gets slept on and every encounter ends up being like uh, initiative right on top of you. And it's good sometimes. And it certainly can happen sometimes. And you're rolling dice, you may end up with really close distances or really far distances, but you want to have that full range to give people the chance just makes those kinds of choices. And then you're gonna take all these things, like I talked about a few minutes ago, you're gonna take the, what creatures you spotted, how many of them there are, how far they are from you, you know, anything else about the creatures when you look at them, any kind of lore they have, are they, like I said, you, it's a harpy, but we're not anywhere near that, we're way inland. So then you think about, well, what is a harpy doing there? It's by itself. Come up with those goals in the moment and then play those up so that it's not about just, okay, here's an encounter that's just this obstacle. Oh, let's just, you know, again, like Final Fantasy, when that combat shows up, okay, I'm just gonna fight through this combat. No, think about what does that mean for the area? What's near here? If you're looking at your hex map, you're like, okay, here's this harpy that popped out, and I know there's some ruins that are one hex away. Maybe the harpy's connected with those ruins somehow. And maybe, even though that wasn't anything that I had planned on, I could figure out a way to integrate them so that it's, not only does it make sense to me, and it makes sense to the party as it's happening, but can actually be additive to what's going on. Maybe they were trying to get to the ruins, and maybe they were even a little bit lost, but now they've spotted this harpy flying in from the direction the ruins are if they're smart and think about it, they might go maybe the harpy's from the ruins and now they can think okay the harpy was coming from that direction so let's recenter on that direction now they found it and then again that decision making so you're going to roll all that up together and the great thing about making these encounter tables regardless of which one you use whether you're doing let's see here's the where's the dmg one first edition dmg Lots and lots of tables. The nice thing is once you have these for your campaign, for your world, you're putting in a lot of work to make these tables, fine-tuning the system, fine-tuning the, the methods you're going to use, fine-tuning the creatures that are going to be on it. But once you've done that work, it's yours. You've got it. And you don't have to do it all at once. There's no, you know, here you'll look in the DMG, and I'm, I'm looking at subarctic encounters for the plains, scrub. Okay, but if my encounter doesn't take place in subarctic scrub, or in the subarctic you know, biome at all, then I don't need to worry about that right now. If you just develop them over time, if you know that, well, here's what's around me. The party is in this area that I think they're going to be operating in for a while. And there's hills, there's forest, there's plains, and, and maybe the river. Then I just make those. And I get those, I get them all tweaked up. And then if they start moving towards, and I'll, okay, they're going to go to 
in another different area and there's going to be mountains and there's going to be marshes. Okay, well then I go and do that. But when once I've got this whole thing set up and you know, we live in the internet age, you've got you know, you know, Google Sheets and all these all these different online ways you can keep it if you're, you know, playing online, you could probably I'm sure there's a way to program it on roll 20 or whichever tabletop simulator you use. But once you have these set up, yeah, you've put in a fair amount of work if you're really being thoughtful about the creatures and the setup and everything. But once that's done, it's done. And if you stay in that campaign world, if you're someone that runs a lot of campaigns in the same sort of shared world, once you put that work in, you just get to have the benefit of it for you know, potentially years and years and years of, okay, well, oh, they're going through the planes again. Well, great. I don't need to come up with anything new. I know all the plane stuff, so I'll just use my existing planes tables. And even moving from campaign world to campaign world, a lot of the creatures, they're going to pass over. You know, you just might take, okay, so we were playing in Greyhawk and it has these kind of creatures and now we're moving to Forgotten Realms and I just have to... I'm, a lot of them are going to be the same. So I'm just going to swap out these for these, maybe add these new on there, take those off. And so you end up spending less and less time of it over over the long haul because you can just take your, your good basic core setup and then just reuse it and repurpose it over and over again. So as a thing to do, it's a good pursuit because I think it pays off in the long haul because once you have these set up, they're good for pretty much as long as you're playing these games. You could even port it from system to system version to version you know a lot of people will still go back i will still go back and i will use these sorts of tables to run my monsters and i don't know what the dm the dungeon master's guide is what 1980 according to this it's or at least this version it's 1979 that's a lot of utility from a system and as you continue to get uh, used to it. You can tweak it. You can always tweak the numbers, tweak the math to get the kind of setup that you want. But that's really, I guess, if you were going to we talk about the three pillars a lot of times in gaming, I think that I think that covers probably the last major pillar of the hex crawl, which is if we have sort of the terrain and we have the sort of ter the terrain and, and physical characteristics of the hexes of the the world you're going through, and you have the, sort of the movement and and and, and player the abilities of what players can do in there. Then this third thing of what are the creatures and what is the wildlife and what are they doing. This is that third pillar. So hopefully this will help you set up your uh, random encounters for your uh, your hex crawl. Oh, one other thing we mentioned before I forget is you don't have to use these tables just for random encounters. I think I touched upon this in an earlier video. One of the things you can do is use these tables to inform the descriptions of your terrain. So if you're moving through a section and you're, you're in the planes and you look at in your planes, you know, random encounter table and you okay, okay, there's a good chance you're going to find, you know, uh, prairie dogs and there's a good chance they're going to find bison and there's a good chance that they're going to, and there's a, maybe a lesser chance they're going to find, say, some kind of lion and then wolves maybe a little bit or some kind of dogs. And maybe there's a really small chance they're going to find something like a griffin. Okay, I don't know if griffins live in the plains. I don't know if any of these live in the plains, but that's what I'm going with. Then if your ranger goes, okay, I want to make a survival track looking for tracks, you can then look at your random encounter table and just do some calculus in your head. Maybe you can roll some dice and say, okay, you see some, definitely see some prairie dog activity. You see some... Uh, bison tracks and then uh, maybe you spot a wolf track or maybe I rolled a die and say oh you spot a track track that looks lion like but it's a bigger heavier track you're not exactly sure and they sort of end abruptly which would I'm thinking you know if the griffin sort of takes flight and kind of what that might look like as tracks so it's not even just the stuff you might encounter but it also can inform that description maybe they come across you know some stool uh, from a creature. Whatever, there's a lot of ways you can use those tables. It could be that if they go into a village and they're saying, hey, we're going to be moving these planes soon, what kind of stuff we can expect, the villagers should be able to tell them most of the common things is going to be known. They're going to know, yeah, there's lots of prairie dogs and yeah, you got there's bison, they're pretty much fine. You got to watch out if for the, the dogs, but they don't usually bother you if you don't bother them. And then the lions, you know, whatever, they're usually active in twilight, so be careful. And oh, by the way, we've there's a legend of like a flying lion. Right, which would be the griffin, which maybe only one or two people have seen, whatever, something like that. So the tables are not only informing you as far as creating these encounters in the wilderness, they're also informing your descriptions of the wilderness, and they're even informing these encounters that don't actually take place during the hex crawl, which is when you're entering a village or a space, what do people know about it? One of the things they're going to know about is that wildlife, and that, again, is adding 
adding fodder for your players to creatively come up with decisions they want to make, chase down leads, information, things that will help them make decisions. If they're choosing between following the river or the plains and the river's got big fish and there's a dragon turtle that some of the people have seen in there or the plains seem to be relatively benign, that helps make an informed decision for them as to where they're going. And it also brings them in the world, it makes the world feel alive. So random encounters for your hex crawl. Hopefully you use them. I think they really help bring the wilderness alive. Again, I think it's that third pillar. Let me know if this helped you. Let me know if you have any particular random encounter methods, throw it in the comments or come find me on Twitter or Reddit or wherever. But uh, hopefully this was useful to you and I will talk to you later.